Thank you very much for the, for the very kind introduction. As, as they would say, I mean, are we having fun yet? This Brexit thing does seem to be for real. I think the yen has just strengthened to about 102. Um, what I, I mean, I'm very honored to, uh, to be invited here every year. And I feel that really we've sort of come full circle. I think five years ago in uh, 2011, I stood on this stage and I said, I've got the greatest job in the world because I'm the last Japan optimist. <laughs> Two years ago on the stage, you know, I was introduced and saying, well, you were the last optimist in 2011, but today you are, you can say that you were the first optimist. And I sort of feel it's gone full circle that now I'm back and sort of saying, yes, I am the last optimist, because obviously there's a lot of pessimism that has started to come through again in Japan. I mean, the economy has basically flatlined over the last six or nine months here. And what I want to do over the next sort of 30 minutes or so is just give you some thoughts, some little nudges in terms of, you know, what's going on, what one should be focusing on. Because obviously, you know, economic debate, a lot of people always have an agenda that they're driving. And I want to show, for example, that in Japan right now, we've got negative interest rates, but that the negative interest rates, yes, are hurting the Japanese banks, but that Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe is actually benefiting from this quite tremendously. So look a little bit through the sort of pervasive, the normal debate that is uh, um, making the headlines here and focus a little bit on what's going on now. We do have to set it a little bit into the global context. I mean, we are sort of living in an upside down world. I mean, nobody in your economics class taught you that you were going to get paid to borrow money. I mean, you do have 12 trillion of global debt actually trading on negative interest rates. Right? So you've got all this monetary experiment going on, and if you look at the Japan case, it sort of demonstrates very, very well what is going on around the west of the world. We have been messing with money. Japan's economy, GDP, is basically today where it was in 1995. It's exactly the same in terms of the absolute amount of yen that the economy has. But you see that the Bank of Japan, the central bank's balance sheet, has been pumped up by almost 50% of GDP. But you see that the amount of money that is being created really is not creating any economic growth. You see, in 1995, one yen from the Bank of Japan gave me 12 yen of GDP. Today, it is only 1.5 yen of GDP. And by the way, this is not that different from what we are seeing in the United States, what we've seen in England, what we're seeing in Europe, right? So there's this enormous realization coming through. Money does not create economic growth. And we want to talk a little bit about the great part of Japan that you can actually create growth. Now, the good news is that I actually believe that in Japan, we're at the end of this tunnel, where this pushing on a string is actually going to start to create a new credit cycle. This is the price of money, the average loan rate. If you and I go to a bank, what is the interest rate we can actually procure? And that has dropped very dramatically. You may be aware, a 10-year mortgage rate in Japan today is 60 basis points, 0.6%. At the end of last year, it was 1.4%. And you do actually see that with this collapse in the price of money, finally, it is beginning to work. The red line there is credit, not by the central bank, but credit by the private banking system that is actually being generated. And you see, it's very interesting, right? Throughout you know, the early part of the millennium, the price of money fell down, but people wanted to own less credit. There was this balance sheet recession. Everybody paid back debt rather than investing into new projects. Now, the empirical evidence, the reality is that, yes, over the last three years, there is actually net credit creation coming through. So there's the beginnings of the signs that a positive 
that a virtuous cycle is actually starting to come through. What is interesting, who benefits from this? It is not the old Japan. If you look at credit over the last three years, you see that industrial companies, oops, sorry, industri what is this? Industrial companies, uh, industrial companies have not really borrowed. But the big beneficiary is actually Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe. And in fact, I mentioned this drop in interest rates that just happened over the last three months. Mortgage refinancings are rising at a rate of about five times the level that we've seen over the last year. If 10% of the mortgages get refinanced into today's interest rate, the boost to disposable income because of lower interest expense is equivalent to about half a percent of disposable income. So don't fall into the trap. Oh, monetary policy is not working. Negative interest rates are not working. Yes, they are hurting the banks. The banks make less profit, but that profit is actually transferred to the Japanese household sector, to the Japanese people. So it's quite interesting. Now, this is Japan's GDP, as I mentioned, flatlined. I mean, it goes up and down, right? Of course, I'm extremely happy because that speech on being the last optimist on Japan was right around here, and it has actually grown. Right? It's just it's not very high growth, right? So let's figure out what the bull case for Japan is. And I want you to put yourself in my position. Put yourself in my shoes. My job is to praise Japan, to advertise Japan. And I work in the world of money. And the world of money is very nasty. It's all these hedge funds who have no time. They can invest anywhere in the world. And typically, you've got about 12 seconds. You've got this elevator pitch. What is the best thing about Japan? Why should you commit your money, your client's money, into Japan? What, is, what do you think? What's, what's the greatest thing that Japan has to offer? What do you think? Womenomics. Womenomics. Very interesting. <laughs> Women is, of course, my wife is awesome. <laughs> That's absolutely true. My wife is absolutely awesome. That is very true. By the way, it is very interesting because when I ask these questions at various talks, you know, nobody has ever said the men. <laughs> so I'm waiting for that, Kimura-san, you know, to actually start to come through here. But what is the best thing about Japan? And, you know, there's no correct answer, right? Um, you know, people typically sort of say, you know, it's anzen anshin, it is safe, it's got a diligent workforce. All of these things are true, but in my opinion, the real strength of Japan is that it is unbelievably rich. This is one of the richest countries in the world when it comes to intellectual property. This is research and development as a share in the national economy. And you see that there never, ever was a lost decade. Throughout the 1990s, throughout the early part of the millennium, Japan continued to invest in the future. They never stopped doing so. There's only one country on earth that is higher than Japan. Do you know which one? Israel, exactly. Israel is at 5.5%, and in my opinion, Israel and Japan have a lot in common. They've got no natural resources, they live in a kind of nasty region, and all you've got to survive is your brain power. So this focus on relentless innovation is actually happening. So I've got this standing argument with Michael Porter, who is the guru of global competitiveness at the Harvard Business School. And about eight years ago, we were on a panel together, and he had this great remark. He said, ah, yes, but yes, but yes, but you know, you're way too bullish on Japan. Japan, Japan, Japan has not invented anything since the Sony Walkman. So I said, Michael, what car do you drive? And he said, oh, I drive a Lexus. <laughs> Point taken, yes? Outside of the consumer electronics industry, outside of the consumer electronics industry, I beg you, find me one industry where Japan is not a top global competitor. There's no question that the Japanese companies did not do a very good job at commercializing all the patents, all the technology that they have, but that's because over the last 20 years, there were fires burning at home. 
you had deflation, you had lousy politics, you had a bad banking system. <coughs> so as a result of that, you know, you were fighting fires here on the home front rather than commercializing your product. This has come to an end. This is a rich country. And now this wealth of intellectual property, this wealth of creativity, this wealth of innovation power is actually being exploited. A couple of examples. Shipbuilding. This year, 2016, Japan is very likely to become the world's largest shipbuilder again. Oh my God, Jesper, what are you talking about shipbuilding? That's so 19th century. We want to know about <laughs> Google. We want to know about all this application. When is the Japanese Snapchat version going to come out, right? Look, whatever. Shipbuilding is a very real business, right? You actually need to ship stuff back and forth. Logistics is a big business. The Japanese are super competitive again. They never stopped investing in the future. Ships have changed. There's a lot of rules and regulations now, particularly on the environment. They are stink pots. So you've got to be ecologically, you've got to be CO2 efficient. And Japanese shipyards, because they never stopped to focus on innovation, Japanese shipyards today can build ships that are 15 to 20 percent more CO2 environment, environmentally efficient than anything that the Koreans can build. So it's very interesting. This relentless focus on research, this relentless focus on innovation is coming through. Japan is also cheap. I mean, people forget we've had, yes, thank you, 30 years of deflation while the rest of the world had inflation. So as a result of that, you're actually priced back into global competitiveness. Do you know that today it is cheaper to produce rice in Japan than in the People's Republic of China? This is very, very interesting, and it's exactly why Trans-Pacific Partnership, agricultural deregulation and liberalization is going to work. If you're not competitive, no way you're going to break down protectionist barriers. If you are competitive in terms of pricing, you are actually going to be you know, amenable to deregulation and liberalization. And you're seeing this, one of the great success stories of what's been going on over the last three years is the fact that food and drink and agriculture product exports have actually more than doubled. And as you probably know, whether it's in Ibiza or in Berlin or in New York, the cool drink to have is sake. So they've actually done a great job of branding, right, as well. But the key point is, I've got the intellectual property. I am priced back into global competitiveness, which, by the way, is true for labor as well. Japanese labor has become cheap. It is now cheaper to run a Starbucks in Tokyo than it is to run a Starbucks in Hong Kong, Manhattan, or London. The other thing that is quite important, and I apologize, there's a lot of numbers here, is that from an investment perspective, from a structural perspective, Japan has fundamentally changed. Japan used to be an insider's club. It was the Mitsubishi group, it was the Mitsui group, it was the Sumitomo group. If you were not a member of that club, you had very little access to uh, accounts, how decisions were, were, were being made. The governance structure was dominated by the mochiai, by the cross shareholdings, which used to make up about half of the market capitalization. Today, cross ownership is down to less than 10%. So these changes in the system mean that Japan is no longer a club system, but Japan is now open. You've got accountability, you've got transparency, you know how decisions are being made. And it's very interesting that you know, foreign investors even now, which own about a third of the Japanese market, are having an increasing voice in, in the decision-making process. And you've just had a couple of months ago, you know, 7i, the great 7i, you know, one of the great companies in the world, the, trend, the leadership transition was influenced positively right, by a global investor, which would have been totally unthinkable just a couple of years ago. So I'm very rich in terms of intellectual property. I'm priced back into the market. And I am an open system. Now, I am also unbelievably global. I mean, this is how profits 
are being made in Japan. Only 41% of all profits are generated in Japan. Basically, Toyota has not made money selling a car in Japan for the last five, six years. There's a reason for why Ford pulled out of this market. But you make your money 28% from exports and 31% of Japan's profits actually come from offshore operations. And it's very interesting, it's not China, but it is you. It is America that matters. I'm always asked, what's the biggest risk to your optimism on Japan? The biggest risk is very simple. If America has a recession, Japan will have a problem because a quarter of the earnings are directly dependent from the United States of America, which, by the way, is also why the exchange rate, the dollar-yen, and the Japanese stock market are basically linked at the hip, right? What's different this time? I mean, this is sort of the dinner discussion, right? And I can say, ha ha, you know, I've been in Japan for 31 years. You ask, what fundamentally is different? Why are things ticking differently? And I think we've got social forces and economic forces. The most important social force, in my opinion, is that Japan now has a rival. Japan does not want to become a colony of the People's Republic of China. And the whole Senkaku incident right, basically focused exactly that debate. I mean, people forget, why did Abe make a comeback? Abe was a loser, he was a failed politician. Why did he make a comeback? Because three months before the LDP presidential election, we had the Senkaku issue, and Abe's nationalistic or patriotic or nativist, whichever you want to call it, his national credentials actually got him up to the, to the whore. And I think that you know, the, 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 he's still at 50, 60% popularity three years into power precisely because they do want to unify. And I often say, you know, the best thing about Japan is technology, the research and development. Well, Kurosan, what's the worst thing of Japan? What do you think? What's the worst thing of Japan? I always say kete no ryoku, right? The Japanese don't know how to make a decision. They don't want to make a decision because it's supposed to be consensus. You're not supposed to be a dictator, right? So it, everything takes a lot of time. Whether you like Abe or not, they are making decisions. These decisions are uncomfortable. There is no taboo. You couldn't talk about the Constitution. Now you can. You could not talk about security. Now you can. You could not talk about energy policy. Now you can. Are you comfortable with the debate? I don't know. It's called the democratic process. But the interesting thing is what sparked all of this is the fact that Japan you know, is now having a real rival, does not want to become a colony of the People's Republic of China, and the elite here knows to be taken seriously by the Chinese and by the Americans, you have to perform. So that driver, I think, is very important. The final one is also regime certainty, you know, which is, I mean, God, 31 years in Japan, there have been exactly two guys, two prime ministers, who were in power for more than a year and a half, Nakasone and Koizumi. Everybody else was gone within a year and a half. I mean, you can't run a country that way you know, with this uncertainty. And whether you like Abe or not, again, I'm indifferent, these people will be in power for at least another three years. There's no question about that, and it's quite possible that they'll actually extend this. And that's interesting because they are actually very pro-business. In my opinion, Japan today is the most pro-business government we've got in the industrialized world. This year, 2016, Germany win, will win the European Championship. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, that's... That, I, uh, I get distracted. <laughs> no, but this year, 2016, Japan is the only country where corporate taxes are being cut, right? Also, everything that is on the agenda is pro-business. There's deregulation, there's privatization. Is it going too fast? Is it going too slow? Depends who you are. If you work for Mitsubishi Corporation, it's way too fast. If you work for an American company or for an entrepreneur company, it's going way too slow. 
welcome to the debate, but the agenda is definitely pro-business. The other thing is that there is a real stick. Japan has fundamentally changed. Japan is now a deficit country. Japan's household savings rate is now negative, which is perfectly normal. That is because of the demographics. The average age in Japan is now 50 years old. The average age is the first country in the history of the world that we know of, you know, that it, where the average age is 50. Today, you've got one in five people who lives off a pension. By the time of the Tokyo Olympics, one in four will live off a pension. The pension is typically about 53% of what you used to earn. So to subsidize your quality of life, what do you do? You draw down your savings, and that's exactly what is going on here. But what does that mean for you and I? This is the engine that drives the changes in corporate governance, why the stewardship code is in place, why the governance code is in place, why Japanese companies who three or four years ago did not know how to spell ROE or ROA, today it's on the second page of every Japanese company. It's not because they've seen the light. No, there is real economics, and it's an economics of scarcity. And you're seeing this, by the way. Japan, in terms of capital stewardship, is the best of the industrialized market. Dividends and share buybacks are surging in Japan at the highest rate of any industrial economy in the world. And again, the driver is not Abenomics. The driver is the economics of scarcity. Japan is running out of money. The other thing is, of course, demographics. This is the cool thing, right? And you've heard me say this before. This is what it looks like. The population peaked in 2010. On the new population census now, in 307 years, 11 Japanese will be left, right? <laughs> so this is wonderful. Now, when was the last time you cared about what happens in 300 years? Unless you're a Buddhist, right? You don't care, right? The reality is that actually Japan is still growing. This is the labor force. This is the people who are actually working. Japan creates more non-farm jobs per month than the United States does on a population-adjusted basis. And it's very, very interesting, right? You see this, and it's, of course, womenomics. The female participation, you know, is increasing. You do see an overall increase, you know, in the quality of jobs that are actually being created. And that's what I want to talk about. You remember, this was me when I came to Japan in 1986. Uh, I'm the fat guy. Um, well, no, the fat guy is obviously, I mean, he's not fat. He's a, you know, wonderful man, uh, Konishiki. Um, but, you know, that was me, but you see what a Japanese diet does, right? It's really nice. Um, youth imperative. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the positive aspect of demographics. And if I can leave you with one thought today, the one thought is Japan will be the only advanced industrial economy where we will see the rise of a new middle class. And the reason is exactly the demographics. Look at this. The kids in their 20s, sorry, I'm old. I'm more than twice that age. Um, you know, the kids in their 20s are going down by a quarter of a million every year. That's where you want to be. I do want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. I mean, look at this. Last year, 98% of the university graduates found and got offered a full-time job within 10 days of looking for a full-time job. This is spectacular. It's exactly where you want to be. You want to be where there is scarcity, where there is shortages. The other thing is that the labor market in Japan is now changing very much for the better. Japan is in a demographic sweet spot. This everybody talks to you about. This is the number of people who are employed as a hiseisha, so they are arbaito or contract workers, right, or part-time workers. This 40% of all Japanese who get a paycheck are employed on a part-time basis. 
Lifetime employment is dead. In fact, if you draw a chart here, lifetime employment you know, basically is down to about 17% of total employment in Japan. The old Japan is gone. Now what is happening, precisely because you have this scarcity of labor, more and more leading companies are rehiring part-time employees on a full-time basis. Hitachi, Toyota, Corporate, Toyota, uh, NTT, fast retailing, the list goes on. Of course, they're still hiring part-time workers, but last year, for the first time in 22 years, for the first time in 22 years, Japan actually created full-time jobs, about 280,000. And by the way, of those 280,000, half of them, of the full-time jobs, were women in their 30s and 40s. So it's very interesting, but the key issue is Japan is in a demographic sweet spot precisely because of this scarcity that you actually have got going on here. Now, what, <laughs> what is the difference between a part-time worker and a full-time worker? There is three principal differences. The first one is money, and you know the money comes in two forms. One is benefits. Basically, across all industries, go up by about 15, 1, 5 percent. But much more important, the bonus, right? In, as a part-time worker, you do not get paid a bonus. As a full-time worker, you do. The bonus across industries is about 35 percent on average. So my income actually goes up by 50 percent. Second money difference is credit. Love or money does not buy you credit if you're a part-time worker. You have difficulty getting a credit card, you cannot get a mortgage. The moment I become a full-time employee, I've got access to credit. Remember one of my first slides that bank lending is now growing, that mortgage credit is growing? To verify my thesis, am I right in my thesis of this new middle class? I look very carefully at the bank credit, at specifically the mortgage lending data. And while Japan slipped into recession over the last six, nine months, over the last six to nine months, mortgage credit growth has actually accelerated. Housing starts have actually accelerated. And no, it's not Chinese speculators buying Japanese property. It is actually real people who are moving out of their home from their parents, setting up you know, their own family life. Because the third benefit of being a full-time worker is, I'm, apologies to all the ladies in the room, but Japanese women are extremely smart. As a part-time worker, I can get a date, but I cannot get married. The moment I get married, my probability of, go, of getting married goes up to 92%, right? It's very interesting. So, you know, you do actually see that household formation, marriages, child, childbirth is actually going up. We're at the beginning of an inflection point. As you know, the birth rate used to be, you know, five, six years ago, about 1.25. Now it's 1.42. Still a long way to go, but the economics of creating better quality of jobs, access to credit, security of income, that's exactly how you create an endogenous virtuous cycle. So you do want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese. It's a great situation. Now, what about my age? You know, the guys, yeah, Mick Jagger, there's a lot of them, right? The number of people over the age of 66 is going up every year by 434,000 people, which is why I love being in Japan, because on average, Japan is the only country where everybody else is getting older faster than I do. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a great place to be. I mean, that is, you know, but look, you've got this barbell going on now. The good news is, and I know that we're in Japan, you're not supposed to talk about money. We all need to be very Jimmy. Yadi da di da. I'm sorry, these guys are unbelievably rich. The baby boom generation never got disenfranchised. The baby boom generation got, entered the workforce in the early 80s, got married and took out a mortgage in the mid to late 1980s, and it's been sayonara ever since because the house value completely collapsed. So it was very kurushi 
You had to pay back your mortgage into negative equity. But you never got fired. The bank never foreclosed on you. Japan honored its contract to the baby boom generation. Now, 25 years later, the loans are paid off. And you actually do find, you know, Japan is very, very rich of the assets. The people over the age of 60 own 70% of all the assets. And my favorite statistics in Japan, 45% of all Japanese over the age of 20 have no debt. There is no debt. But they own the home that they live in. This is unbelievably rich. In the United States, the number, and I'm a little murky, I'm not 100%, don't quote me on the data, but in the US, the number is about 20%, right? So it's quite interesting, you know, you do have this dynamics here. You've got a match made in heaven. You've got the old who are retiring, who are very rich, and you've got the young who are in short supply, so their wages are actually being bid up. By the way, it's interesting, right? Everybody tells you, oh, shunto. The Shunto this year was such a disappointment. Oh my God, last year the base pay negotiation yielded a result of around 2%. This year it is only 1%. Abenomics is failing. Really? What does that have to do with anything? That's the average. I mean, there's this guy here going down. He's expensive. And there's this guy here going up. Did anybody tell you that starting salaries for university graduates are rising at a rate of 5.8%? Again. You and I, sorry, me more than you, I'm old. Of course, I've got a political economy. I know I'm worried about my pension. But meanwhile, there is actually youth dynamics that is actually starting to come through, which gets me to the exciting part. We know that money does not create wealth. Printing money is just printing money. It doesn't do anything, right? But what actually creates wealth? There's only one consistent data point that goes across all countries about all stages of development, what actually creates economic growth is entrepreneurship, right? The right-hand chart here is the share of entrepreneurs versus economic growth there. What's the country at the very top here? It's, it's, it is Israel, that's exactly right. Very good, you know, you get to collect $200. No. Um, so it is Israel. Of course, you know, it's important that Germany is way ahead of France. Very important, <laughs> right? So maybe, maybe France, I mean, that's the Germans say, oh my God, you know, we wish France would leave the Euro. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that's, <laughs> excusez-moi, pour tous les Français. You know, but it's interesting, Japan is actually not doing that badly, but it's obviously not doing particularly well in this whole, you know, sort of entrepreneurship agenda. You see it in job creation, right? The only things that create jobs are new companies. In Japan, over the last five years, companies less than five years old have created two million jobs. Companies between five and 10 have created another job. Everybody else, everybody who's older than 10 years old does not create jobs on a net basis. So the real question is, what is Japan doing to spur and, fo and foster entrepreneurship. And this is where it gets a little tricky, right? You do actually see that the number of large companies is actually starting to go down, right? There's mergers and acquisitions. Actually, some companies do go bankrupt. And, you know, there is a lot of new creativity that is coming through. So there is entrepreneurship, you know, creative destruction and entrepreneurship actually starting to come through. But the problem is, and this is a problem worldwide. This is a problem in the United States of America. This is a problem in Japan. That with all this new technology that supposedly we have, with all the internet revolution, all the Amazons of the world, there is no productivity growth. In fact, productivity is negative in both Japan and the United States. There's a big conundrum. You know, economists have long debates. You know, why is that? Is that because there's too many rules and regulations, right? So that your output, you know, stays constant or increases a little bit, but now you've got to hire 10 compliance guys, you know, in order to get things done. There could also be just a simple measurement problem. But for you and I as an entrepreneur, what is interesting is never mind the academic debate. If there were productivity growth, there would be investment spending. 
private entrepreneurs would see an opportunity to invest in something that has a higher rate of return, that has higher rates of, of productivity. And the real deflation forces is exactly this lack of productivity prospects that you have. Because if you don't see productivity growth, if you don't see projects that you can invest in that is going to raise your efficiency, you're not going to invest. Which is why companies around the world are hoarding cash. Also, you know, there's a lack of new growth markets. Again, the last 20 years were easy because China went from the 14th century into the 21st century. I mean, China today has the bullet train. The Shinkansen there is perfectly fine. Better than the French trains. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, but it's interesting, right? So, you know, there is this here, and in Japan specifically, and this is a criticism, and something where should the Abe administration be focusing a little bit more on, yes, there is a lack of deregulation, and there is this enormous support for zombie companies, because interest rates have been kept at record low levels for a long time. Food for thought. Deflation, deflation, deflation is bad, it's terrible. Is deflation really that bad? Look at this. This is America, and this is Japan. This is service prices. This is not the price of widgets. Goods go up and down. They are impacted by the global business cycle. They're impacted by the exchange rate. They're impacted by commodity prices. Services, you cannot arbitrage. You are stuck in your home country. In the United States over the last 15 years, service prices have basically gone up by 50%. Has your income gone up by 50%? You know, right in front of us. I mean, any of us who's got kids in college, college tuition is doubling every six years. Medical, where would you rather be, in the US or in Japan? <coughs> Rent is a similar sort of picture. Ask yourself the question, what's the difference? How does this happen? Remember her? Who is she? She's my second favorite Japanese woman after my wife. <laughs> right? This is on the Narita Express, but you can go on any train, right? The door opens, somebody bows and smiles and pushes the thing. And you say, hey, hey. You say, I would like a can of Coke. And she says, hi, Yoroshiku, and go, how much, what's the price? It's 150 yen. How much is a can of, where's the woman, there's somebody here from Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna have to, sorry, have to put you on the spot. How much is a can of Coke at the average Jido Hanbaiki? It's about 150 yen, right? How can that be? I mean, there's no way that a can of Coke, 150 yen at the Jido Hanbaiki, versus, you know, this complicated, I mean, I've gotta pay her salary and all of that. How does this happen? Well, she, works for a subsidiary of Japan Rail. That subsidiary is not in the business of making money. That business is, that, that company, that subsidiary has only one focus, which is omotenashi, which is to provide a service to you, right? So as a capital investor in Japan Rail, I lose out. Because of course they could have, you know, higher profitability if they were to charge 500 yen, which when you go to a German train, is exactly what happens. There's some disgruntled man who sort of comes through, you know, who sort of comes through and sort of yells at you, you know, well, Coke, it's bad for you. You know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so, sorry. It's a great drink, Coca-Cola, Germans love it. <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, anyway, you get the point, but just again, ask yourself the question, right? What is it, you know, who is actually subsidizing who here? Very quick on Prime Minister Abe, I mean, they did actually tighten fiscal policy. Uh, in 2014, taxes went up. Very important, by the way. The Abe administration is the only administration that did actually read Mr. Piketty's book, right, about you know, wealth inequality, uh, you know, income inequality. Japan is the only country that did actually increase the top income tax rate, right? from 40 to 45% at the national level, which means the top income tax rate has gone up from 50 to 55%. They also, you know, did all, all sorts of other uh, tightening measures. This year, cyclically, fiscal policy is actually gonna be eased up. You've got the cutting corporate taxes, you did get helicopter money. In the month of May, 1.2 million Japanese people, the working poor, 
received a cash transfer from the Treasury, from the Ministry of Finance, of 30,000 yen. You will get another supplementary budget, and of course, Prime Minister Abe did push back out the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the consumption tax increase next year. So fiscal policy is actually going from breaking to actually be an accelerator, which is why cyclically, I think the second half of the Japanese economy, the second half of 2016, is actually going to be very good. Now, how can they afford to do this, given that there's this enormous amount of debt that we've got outstanding? Well, actually, the debt's free. I mean, this is the red line here is about as flat as you can get. This is the interest expense. How much does it cost to service the debt outstanding that has not gone up over the last decade? So from the Ministry of Finance's perspective, sorry, <laughs> from, the, you know, from the budget perspective, there is this illusion. And that number is actually going to go down now that we've got negative interest rates, which means that there's no pressure to actually you know, consolidate you know, the balances. And of course, this is being helped by the fact that you've got effectively the nationalization of debt going on here. This is the ownership of the JGBs, the ownership of government liabilities, of securities. And you see that over the last three years, the private sector has been selling, while the Bank of Japan has been the only buyer. Today, the Bank of Japan owns about one third of all government debt. In about a year and a half, no, in about two years' time, they will own 50% of all the debt. And that's when they will restructure the debt, in my opinion, and turn it into a zero coupon perpetual, right? Which uh, means you can carry this on at infinitum. Final thought, nothing is really for free. The Bank of Japan has been buying a lot of debt, correct? But the foreigner has also been a buyer of debt. Foreign ownership of the public deficit has now gone up to 11% if you look at the entire debt. If you take out the debt that is owned by the Bank of Japan, which means the free float, what is actually available in the public market, it's now almost 20%. So again, remember my point about the savings rate. Japan has a negative savings rate. Japan is in need of money from the rest of the world. Even with the record printing by the Bank of Japan, you do actually find right, that the dependency on global savings the dependency on foreign money is actually going up rather than going down, which is exactly why I think structurally the Japanese currency is likely to be a weak currency. I look bad today. I know the yen goes from 106 to 103 because of Brexit. Look, the world's a complicated uh, place. To get exchange rate right, you need to get both sides, the Japan side and the global side correct. But what are we seeing? This debt monetization that is going on, the growing dependence that we've got on global savings, I think means that structurally over the next three to five years, the Japanese yen is very, very likely to be a weak currency. So what do we have? We've got a national ambition. They do not want to become a colony of China. This allows for decisions and uncomfortable subjects to be touched and decisions actually being made. Japanese companies are incredibly rich where it matters, which is, excuse me, the rich where it matters, which is intellectual property and the base for innovation. You also have got this rising middle class, and of course, Mick Jagger retiring. What does that mean? Well, they are rich, and now all of a sudden they have time, which means that the leisure class in Japan is actually going to be growing quite nicely. Let me stop here and, uh, you know, thank you very much and see whether there are any questions or comments or opinions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesper. That put a hop in my step, especially the last bit on the currency. So with that, before you ask questions, if you can wait for the microphone to come to you and then identify, give your name and your organization. So. Questions? Please. Eric Sedlak, Jones Day. You asked, uh, you mentioned at the beginning what's good about Japan. I mean, one thing obviously is some of the best engineers in the, in the world, and the second is no tipping. Um, 
But I had a question. On the R&D side, how is Japan going to keep going on that side? Because you do have declining um, number of young people, and you also have a declining interest in, in science and engineering. Right. It's very, very interesting, right? The uh, number of university graduates, you know, five years ago was about 72,000. Now it's below 50,000. You know, now, the cohort is shrinking, right? I'm not sure whether there's a declining interest, you know, in, in STEM or in engineering or not. I'm, I'm not 100% I'm not sure of it, but the point still is that sooner or later, Hitachi, and I'm, apologies, I'm just using Hitachi as an example. It's the largest industrial employer of Japan. Sooner or later, Hitachi is going to run out of engineers. So globalizing the workforce, right, that part of the diversity is really the key challenge that Japanese companies face going forward. You've got the integration of women and you've got the integration you know, of international talent right, into the team. That is going to be a very, very big challenge uh, going forward. No other questions. Great. Dozo. Curtis Heron. Uh, let's assume that next year the United States goes into a recession yep. for whatever reason. Yep. Um, how does Japan ride that out? Can they come out on top, or are they going to struggle and suffer along with the U.S. on that? So it's very interesting. Um, you know, I think that for the stock market, if we start there, Right? The answer is that everybody's going to have to revise down their earnings because of the linkage, 25% of earnings coming from the U.S. market. By the way, your lead indicator for this is one thing, car sales. Look at car sales in the United States. Give or take, slightly more than half of Japan's exports to America are cars and car parts. If that thing starts to roll over in the United States, you're going to have some issues in terms of the earnings revisions. Japan domestically, I do not think is going to be very much affected by this. And the reason is exactly this endogenous force that we have, right? The fact that you've got the housing cycle driven not by some sort of speculative bubble, but actually by the fact that young Watanabe is getting married, that young Watanabe gets a better job, gets access to credit, and, you know, can actually take forward. So I think, you know, of course, America sneezing, the rest of the world, there's going to be issues, right? There's no question about that. But in terms of what is my focus in Japan, my focus in Japan is on one thing, domestic, domestic, domestic. The world economy goes up and down. What I'm interested in and why you should be excited about Japan, why your company has got great business opportunities in Japan, is because there's something happening here that is endogenous, that is independent of what goes on in the rest of the world. And that is the domestic economy. And it's not just healthcare. It is not just healthcare, right? It is the whole spectrum of domestic businesses on whether it's tourism, right? Whether it is artificial intelligence, whether it is, you know, the whole real estate market, whether it's the advertising market, you name it, this thing here has got domestic power. Dozo, Frank. <clears throat> Frank Packard, TAP Japan. I wish that you could distribute a little bit more of your animal spirits more widely in the animal, in the uh, Japanese economy. I think it's a very static comment about IP and R&D, but how's it going to get monetized? Or isn't it stuck in universities? Where does the venture capital community come in? Where does the entrepreneurs coming in? You're a great economics researcher. Can you spread some of your animal spirits as well? But, I mean, so, that's what the Japanese economy really needs to harvest your static analysis. I mean, it is, it is spectacular, right? And, and you're making you know, some, some, some very, very important points here, right? Um, you know, what's the yashin? How does that stuff get out, right? I mean, my favorite example is still Fujifilm, right? Where remember two or three years ago, there was that Ebola you know, pandemic and you know, all of a sudden they find that somewhere, somebody in some bottom drawer at Fujitsu had discovered the antidote, but nobody ever did anything with that. If that guy was an American or in America, he would have left the company, basically reinvented the patent, right, and have you know, gotten venture capital, blah, blah, blah. You would have had a, a great virtuous cycle, right? So it's, it's very, very interesting, you know, sort of unleashing that beast, right? This is the conundrum that you have. I'm rich in intellectual property but I'm not greedy. Sorry. 
I mean, that, you know, that, and, and that's sort of this conundrum, you know, and that's, you know, sort of the big, the, uh, the big challenge. But that's, I think, where your companies, companies with a global footprint, right, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Asia, you know, whether it's around the world, where, they, where you can come in now because you can buy access to this phenomenal, phenomenal intellectual property, right, commercializing it and scaling it onto the global scale, I think is going to be the big trick. What's the difference between Subaru and Toyota? Do you know Subaru and Toyota were founded at exactly the same year? Subaru had never any interest in being global. Toyota was always very focused on being global. And you know, so that's now you know, one of the largest car company in the world, while Subaru is a nice niche little thing. Sorry, and no offense to people who drive at Subaru. German cars are much better. Um, <laughs> You know, but, 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 you know, so, so where does this ambition come from, right? That's, that's the million dollar question. It's interesting, Frank, so I was at the Kedan Ren a couple of months ago and you're sort of, yes, you know, the, the Kedan Ren, I mean, God, you know, that, that makes the average age of Japan look really young, right? <laughs> um, and you're sort of there and you're doing this blah, blah, you're, you're hopping up and down the stage and it's all good and fantastic, you know? And it's like, the feedback you always get is like in Japan, you know, amongst the senior class, Right? It's, it's almost like, you know, all good news is temporary, but all bad news is permanent. You know, and, and how do you overcome this? We all have to work on it. We all have to work on it. Right? Please. Oh, William. Jasper, I'm going to uh, Bill Bishop with uh, BD. I'm going to not give you a health care question, so we'll, you said it's not all about health care. So let's talk about those that are not healthy, all of those that are dying. Uh, you talked about the figures. Of course, the, the population is going to decline, but that results in somebody uh, not being with us uh, as part of the economy. And I think last year it was around 500,000. You said the over 65 is increasing at about 430,000. The death is about 500,000. So the elderly are rapidly aging. Yep. So the older are aging even faster. Yep. And they're dying. They have homes. Those homes are now empty. And we talked about the real, you were talking about the real estate and housing starts, et cetera. Yep. But if you travel not very far outside of the uh, Tokyo here, not far, maybe an hour and a half, you have ghost towns. Right. Uh, so. There's a lot of empty real estate. I don't know how many Chinese investors are going to have to be buying those. But what do you think about that on its impact on housing or the housing market over time and the difference between the booming Tokyo yep. and the ghost town hinterlands? Yeah. Look, it's, it's a phenomenal point, right? Um, and, you know, again, on average, right, you have the depopulation issue combined with the aging issue, I mean, they, they, they go together, the young leave and the old get older and have nobody to take care of them. I mean, these are very, very powerful frictions, you know, that you've got in the overall system. I have no idea on how to fix the economic problems of Kyushu. I mean, they're doing a great job with these trains, you know, and Kanko, right? Tourism, yes, it's a beautiful countryside, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes, I am talking about Tokyo, I'm talking about Osaka, I'm talking about Fukuoka, which covers 80%, give or take, of the population and will cover 90% of the population before you blink because of the, the, the migration that you have, right? So, the rest of Japan has to be turned into the Grand Canyon National Park. <laughs> no, but, you know, look, I always make the point, you know, it's like, look, I don't care, you can, you can, you can, do, whatever, what, you can do whatever you want, right? The issue is, um, in 10 years' time, in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time, I would bet my bottom dollar that Tokyo is going to be one of the great thriving cities in Asia. I do not know about Kitakyushu or, but Kitakyushu is actually reasonably easy because they, they, there is some industry, right? But, like, you know, what is that, Aichiken, right? No idea. Right? Good skiing. All right. Nice. And the onsen are really nice. And they're going to have robots, right, giving you a massage, which is nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, so we're talking about Tokyo, right? We're talking about Tokyo. But by the way, if you're bullish on Germany, I invite you to go to some of the hinterlands in East Germany, right? Or I invite you to go to some of the hinterlands of Arkansas. No, I hope there's nobody here from Arkansas. Um, you know, I mean, these regional differences, you know, are, are, are an issue everywhere in the world, right? It is interesting, sorry, William, the point I thought you were going to make, right? I thought you were going to, because inheritance tax in Japan is a weird thing. They're increasing inheritance tax because obviously, yes, the old are rich, they have all the assets, so the Ministry of Finance wants to get the assets, right? Which is why inheritance tax rates have been increased. There's also lots of quirks in the way inheritance tax is actually being calculated and assessed that should be changing, right? One of them, for example, is that if you own listed securities, right, your probability of actually having to sell them at a loss is actually very, very high just because of, of some of the accounting rules that are in there, right? which is why every musko and musume, right, is urging their parents to sell all their stocks, right, the moment the market goes up, right? So there are things that need to be changed. But the key issue is, and I, I will, I had this argument, you know, with, in, the, in the prime minister's office. It's like, you know, we talk about the pension system. I mean, pension systems are really complicated because they're basically screwed up everywhere, right? The only way you get a functioning pension system is when your children earn twice as much as you did. That's how you have a healthy pension system. Right? So work on that rather than on ooh, we're going to get, generate a higher rate of return by investing in a hedge fund. It's like, really? I mean, that serves my business perfectly well, but as an economist, not really. Right? Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Those are... <clears throat> uh, Tony Sigardelli, uh, Owl Energy. Um, the first thing I'd like to comment on is that you're right that it's not just the healthcare sector that's being deregulated. I'm from the power sector and it's going through massive deregulation. Um, and it, one of the things I've seen here is that um, we import biomass pellets because we have no labour to chop down the forests that are not being managed properly. Um, and they can be managed sustainably for decades to come. Right. As a foreigner, the obvious answer would be import labor. Right. It's hard enough to import labor at the, at the high end of the market, but to import labor at the middle end or the bottom end of the market, um, there's going to be much harder. And there's about 26 million people who are looking to leave the UK at the moment. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> good. Very, very good point. A couple of things, you know, on that, you know, it's, uh, I'm a member occasionally on, on some of these government advisory forms. And, you know, when they talk about immigration, they always sort of say, oh, Kurdistan, Kurdistan, people like you with a PhD, right? And I said, first of all, I don't have a PhD. I, I, I quit the PhD, right? But, you know, we want the high-powered people, right? We don't want the Kitsui, Kitanai, Kiken, right? Um, really, the high-powered people don't want to work for a Japanese company. I mean, that is just the reality. I had a friend, you know, whose son graduated from MIT, perfectly fine guy got a job offer from a Japanese company, a German company, and an American company. So, you know, Ito-san calls me and says, hey, you know Takeshi, why don't you give him some advice? And I say, Ito-san, what do you want me to tell the guy? Right? If he works for the American company, if he's good and lucky, you need luck. If you're good and lucky in an American company, after 20 years, you can run the company. Right? In a German company, if you're good and lucky, after 20 years, you can be in charge of a region. You know, Asia, Latin America. If you work for the Japanese company, if you're good and lucky in 20 years, what's it going to be? Kacho? <laughs> I mean, sorry, I mean, you know, the, the A-team, the A-team the a is the A-team, right? So the issue is exactly at the ground level. Now, on immigration, just for 30 seconds, since it's such an amazing topic, Japanese politicians are super smart. They honor and value social coherence and social harmony. This is a big part of the wa, right? Okay? So they have made a decision. They will not talk about immigration because immigration is divisive, Immigration is emotional. And by the way, what is interesting, obviously, in the world is that classic immigrant countries, like the United States, like England, like Australia, this is now an emotional issue, right? It's very interesting, 
right? But the Japanese, nope, we shall not, will not talk about immigration. Not talking does not mean not doing. Today, I mean, look at the numbers. Tokyo. Tokyo is what, 38 million people, right? Is about a third of the population, is about 40% of the economy, right? In Tokyo, five years ago, the number of people who received a paycheck, not the population, the workers, the people who received a paycheck, five years ago, 3.1% were non-Japanese. Today, 5.4%. So it's not 11% and there's no Syrians, yes, but it is happening. Look at the convenience stores, right? Lawson, I mean, these are, this is official data, this is published data. Lawson and 7&I, one in three people they've hired over the last three years is non-Japanese. How do they do that? This country is not fundamentalist. This country is pragmatic. When Johns Hopkins University shipped me to Japan in 1986, on my student visa, I was allowed to work for 12 hours a week. Today, you come on a student visa, you are allowed to work for 38 hours a week, which is three hours more than a Frenchman. <laughs> But it's in, you know, I mean, it's quite interesting. And you say, oh my God, it's not an immigration policy. Well, excuse me. It's an immigration policy on my terms. It is on my terms. Japan opening the borders, I think they, sorry, I, I sound like Donald Trump. They'd be nuts. They should build a wall. No, no, no. I, I think Japan is, is doing exactly the right thing. I still have got a youth unemployment rate of around 6%. I still have slack in the labor market. I can still utilize women more effectively. I need to change rules and regulations. You know what is sexy? Oh, your sector, William, healthcare. Everybody complains and says, oh, you know, there's a shortage of nine, what is it, 900,000 caregivers and nurses. 900,000, the shortage. Oh, only 2% of the Filipinos pass the test. That is not interesting. You know what is interesting? Only 42% of the Japanese pass the test. It is a stupid test. <laughs> and the reason is that healthcare in nursing in Japan, I don't know, there are probably some experts here, nursing in Japan does not have a gradation system. You know, in the US or anywhere else, right, you start as a night nurse or you start as a day nurse and you go night nurse, you've got different degrees of tests that you've got to pass. In Japan, the test is to the highest standard. You've got to pass the test for the brain surgeon nurse. So it's quite interesting, right? So we proposed that this should be deregulated, right? Have this gradation system. Guess who was opposed to this? The nursing association and the doctor's association. Okay, why Abe isn't bulldozing this and says, oh, my dead body, we're going to get this done? Okay, whatever, right? So he's not Hillary Clinton. Uh, sorry, the other guy. What's the guy? <laughs> Anyway, you know, so, so there, are each, there are issues and frictions here, you know, but it's, but it's quite interesting to me, you know, there are underutilized resources in Japan. One third, I mean, one third of Japan's arable land is not used. I mean, that's a resource, right? Anyway. What? I, I think we're approaching our 2 p.m. hard stop. So hard stop. with that, I'd ask for everyone to give Jesper a warm <laughs> round of applause. Um, thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure. Oh, Ken, is, Ken is very working very, very hard. Every year he has to put this together and he's doing a fantastic job. No, and no. thank you very much for all the staff from the American Chamber who always do such a superb job. I hope that you enjoyed the luncheon and I hope to see you next year. Thank you.